The goal is that people speak openly at work because we can't be creative and do big things if we aren't able to speak freely. So that's why I feel optimistic because I've come together with this ragtag group of semi-canceled people to try to do a really hard thing and I think we're gonna succeed. Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. You know, this is so fun to have conversations with great Americans. And some of those great Americans are elected officials. Some of them write books. Many of them are my own colleagues who are policy scholars. Some of them are great Americans who have been very successful in multiple arenas. And my guest this week, someone is a, a new friend of the Heritage Foundation, has been successful in multiple arenas, in athletics, in business, as a wonderful mother and wife. So I think you're going to really enjoy this. It's a little bit of change of pace, which you know I like to do. And I'm really grateful for those of you who follow the show every week and you tell me, Kevin, the best thing about your show is that it is a change of pace. And I take that as a great compliment to just keep asking questions and get out of the way. That is a way, Jennifer Say, of saying thank you for being here. You are the founder CEO of XXXY Athletics an accomplished gymnast, wonderful businesswoman, someone focused on raising her family in a normal, common sense America. And God bless you for that. Well, thank you. And thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm also a filmmaker. Can I add that? Oh, please. Yeah. I made a documentary film called Athlete A that came out in 2020. Pe people can watch it on Netflix and we won an Emmy. Athlete A. Yeah. We'll make sure that we, we get that promoted. Yeah. It's about um, Larry Nasser and the abuse. It was a, an investigation into the abuse. Larry Nasser, the former doctor for Team USA Gymnastics, and it really connects his crimes to a broader culture of abuse and covering up well, this well, poor behavior. <laughs> well, thanks for doing that. I mean, what a, what a terrible story, obviously, but it's important to shed light on that so that it's never repeated, right? Yeah, it's a tough film to watch, um, but it ends on a, a high note. Um, the amazing women, the survivors who came forward and um, exposed his crimes and actually exposed the culture of abuse in the sport, which is now, I hope, on the road yeah. to being corrected. Well, and it, it reminds me of the importance of sport. Um, we're going to talk about your story, but it, it reminds me when I was a history professor, and I'm not sure I've mentioned this uh, in the show yet. I taught American history and sometimes taught business history. But one day the dean of the business school came to me and said, Kevin, we have a, uh, a business and history of sports class. Oh, cool. Would you teach it? And I went and asked my department head who remains a friend to this day. So I'm not, I'm picking on him, but I'm not maligning him. And I said, Ken, can I teach this, this sports class? I think it would be really fun. He said, no. Why? And I thought, I, I guess because he needed me to teach another class. I mean, that, that was his thing. But the claim that I made to him, this is the reason why I'm mentioning this, is for those people like us who do politics all the time, or for you where you've been really committed to building at least a couple of businesses I'm aware of or doing this film, it's important we have other outlets, right? To sort of be normal and common sense. And one of the problems with America today, and I, by the way, I think we're going to fix this, is that we take ourselves too seriously. And sports should be an outlet. And therefore, what Larry Nasser did, in addition to the obvious tragedy of the of the, the young women that that he victimized, it robbed us of the innocence that sports That's should it. be. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you a brief story about my athletic career. I um, in in 1985, I went to Moscow. Uh, for the very first Goodwill Games, which was uh, it was started by Ted Turner as kind of an antidote to all the boycotts that had happened. Because in 1980, um, the U.S. boycotted the Olympics, if you recall, because it was in Moscow. And in 1984, the Russians boycotted because it was in Los Angeles. It was a little get back. Um, and Ted Turner felt like sports should be an arena where people come together in the healthy spirit of competition. Doesn't matter what your politics are. These athletes have trained their whole lives. They've given up everything to be the best that they can be. So he initiated this. I don't even know if it exists anymore. I mean, the name is great, right? The Goodwill Games. So I'd forgotten the origins of it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It was sort of a rogue style Olympics competition. I'm not I'm not sure if it exists anymore, but I had the distinct honor of um, going to the very first one in Moscow. And I was told that, you know, at the time, the U.S. gymnasts weren't that good. I mean, I was on the national team. I would become the national champion a year later. But we weren't ranked. Like, now the U.S. gymnasts are the best in the world by far. Then it was Russia. So we all wanted to trade 
leotards and pins and sweats and everything. And I was told the best thing to do is bring Levi's 501s. That's what they want. This is before the wall came down. Levi's were a symbol of, of, of freedom and rugged individualism around the world. And I brought 10 very tiny pairs of 501s that I got at Macy's at the Cherry Hill Mall. And I got all the best stuff. You know, all the pins and the leos from leotards from the Russian gym. And, and, and I mean, you thought you had won the lottery. But. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was the best. So, but it just is sort of a marker, I think, for what America stood for on on the world stage at that time and how this brand embodied that. So, you know, you can imagine that when I was invited to work there many years later in, in 1999, it was a real it was a real honor. And a treat. Tell us about that path from being at the first Good Bull Games, 1985, to getting what I imagine was your dream job, right? For yeah. reasons you, you just described 14 years later. What is Jennifer Say's story? Yeah. I screwed up the year. I just realized it was 1986. I'm getting so old. Goodness gracious. I, I, I can relate. <laughs> the mid-1980s. It was the mid-80s. Yeah. In 1985, it was my first world championships. This is what I'm conflating. And I broke my femur at Worlds, which... People can watch. It's serious it's, business. Yeah, it's bad. It's a dangerous sport. Um, sports are dangerous, which is why we owe it to the athletes to keep them as safe as is possible. Because when you embark upon whatever endeavor, there's already risk and danger involved. But we'll get to that later. Um, and then I came back. I was sort of down and out, written off. You know, you break your femur on the world stage. People think you're done. But I came back less than nine months later and won USA Championships. And despite my successes, I left the sport um, pretty defeated two years later. It's a brutal sport. Um, the injuries, uh, the coaching culture, very abusive emotionally, physically. And now we know there's sexual abuse that's rampant. And so I left feeling like a failure, which is unfortunate as a seven-time national team member and national champion. I went on to Stanford, dusted myself off, kind of pulled myself together. I ended up writing a book many years later in 2008 about the abuse in the sport. Um, and it was the first first person account. And that didn't go great for me. I was you know, talking about it before you were allowed to, but it got me, it toughened me up, prepared me for some future cancellations. <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I started working. I moved to San Francisco after I went to Stanford, um, started working first in an advertising agency and then in the fashion business, two great fashion brands in San Francisco, The Gap. And Levi's, and they're about a mile apart from each other. And I worked at both of them. Um, I started at Levi's in 1999 as an entry level marketing assistant, and I worked there 23 years and climbed my way all the way up the ladder um, to the brand president. And you know, I talk a lot in my second book about what it was like to be a woman in corporate America in the 90s and the 2000s. And I got to tell you, it wasn't great. Um, and I think it's a testament really to how far we've come and how much better, you know, in my time of 23 years, it went from, you know, sexual harassment at sales meetings from drunk sales guys to. Which is just ex explicit and outright. It was I mean, just it wasn't like, subtle at all. no, you were like, so just go. You can't not go to the sales meeting. Just try to avoid any really bad <laughs> situations. Um, and I, I mean, I had four children while I worked there. Um, the first child I had was in 2000 and there was no, you know, mothers. I think I got six weeks off. Um, I had to pump in a, in like a sample closet with a, a, a shower curtain. People would come in, <laughs> you know, by the time I left and had my last child, it was a beautiful room with a refrigerator and it was legally required. And I had had three months of maternity leave. Like, I think these are, I think these are, this is progress for it women. Is, it is progress. Yeah. So I think. It's too bad we don't often acknowledge um, the progress that has been made uh, for women and by women. And I fear now, which I know we'll get to, is some of that is being being turned back. But um, yeah, I worked at Levi's for 23 years. Very proud. I um, helped. I was definitely a part of the team that turned the brand around. It was near bankruptcy in the in the mid to in the like 28, 9, 10. People forget that. Oh. It was in, as you know, it better than anybody, it was in terrible shape. Terrible. I mean, there's like Harvard Business Review articles yeah. written about it. It was in terrible shape. They'd lost their competitive edge. The market changed. You know, it went from three competitors in the marketplace to, gosh, 100 new entries every year, just a gazillion jeans brands. Um, and when you lose that competitive edge and that external focus and the consumer focus, um, you lose. 
And, you know, their, their channels of, I don't know if this is of any interest to anybody, but a distribution, they fell behind, you know, department stores were really lagging. Everybody was indirect to consumer, late to the party on that. But um, I was we're definitely interested in all of that. Oh, way. okay. Yeah. I love talking about that stuff. Um, the consumer aged, we failed to bring in new younger consumers. You need that. That's the lifeblood of the fashion industry. Um, and so, yeah, we really... Um, struggled. It was like, are we going to make it? And uh, we got a new CEO in 2011 and he put together a new leadership team. I think he had a really clear vision for where the business was going to go. And he put me in the um, chief marketing officer role in 2013. And that was definitely a driver of reinventing the brand, me being in that role and rebuilding that team. And in 2019, we had a successful IPO, which was very exciting to be a part of. That'd be so fulfilling personally, because for people on the outside, you know, in our generation in particular, to your point about the mid 80s when Levi's was, it really was the icon of American goodness, yeah. American influence, Americanness. And then yeah. when it, it the, the brand started to go down, for those of us on the outside, we thought this is sort of emblematic of what's going on in the United States. I don't mean it's that as a political comment because that's not our purpose in our conversation today, but really more social and cultural. In other words, people from the political left to the political right at the time could say, man, this stinks well, because you, it's like America getting weaker. You know, it's so interesting you say that because one of the things I used to say all the time when I still work there is that Levi's was the symbol. It brought people together. Everybody wore Levi's cowboys and minivan moms and you know the hip-hop kids and the cool parts of the city like that's amazing everybody wore levi's wears levi's and they do it in their own way it's sort of this really it's like this proxy for what it is, it is. to be american and what rugged individualism is um and that was one of the things we were always very clear about we don't tell you how to wear your levi's you wear them in your own way and you see it across the country like i said minivan moms to the b-boys and the skater kids and the surfer kids it's pretty cool um although that idea that we can come together on anything at this point seems to be um I don't know if I'll call it dated, but not very popular right now. Yeah, so. I was going to say, it's, it's, it's <laughs> aspirational, but it's something more than that. It's It, it seems impossible some days, right? That even, even to say that, sometimes uh, younger friends of mine in D.C. will say, oh, you're such a boomer, Kevin. I said, well, I'm not a boomer. You know, my parents are boomers. And they say, no, that's boomer mentality. That, that there's anything. That, we, that there's anything that we should even strive to be unified around. By the way, I totally reject that. So I reject I, I, it, too. I, I always argue with them on this. Well, look, we probably come from different backgrounds politically. I mean, I like to think that I can um, – reassess my my priors if necessary sure. but i self-identified as left of left of center for probably you know over 30 years and for me i started questioning some of what the left was saying in my city of san francisco in the mid 2010s but then covid just that was just, the breaking point for you that was the breaking point like i said i had other questions before that but to me from day one even before the lockdowns happened, it was such a trespass of the left's stated values. It was so illiberal. There was the censorship. There was the harms done to children, the harms to the most vulnerable among us, the poor. Um, the idea that the government could tell me who I could have in my home and where I could go. Um, my children were in public school and have always gone to public school, which made me unusual for um an executive at any company, I would like to think that even if my kids didn't go to public school, I could see the harm in that. Because let's let me remind you, starting in the fall of 2020, I'm sure you know this, all the private schools opened. In San Francisco, the public schools were open, were, were closed for a full year beyond that. These schools, that's where I lived, are disproportionately populated with low income kids, kids living in poverty, homeless children, black children, Hispanic children. All the groups that the left claims to care about and protect. It was the most hypocritical. It was just so grotesque to me. I couldn't, I couldn't abide. And it made it, I was very outspoken about the school closures in particular. And it made it very hard to stay in San Francisco and to remain a Democrat. I am not a Democrat. And I did not remain in San Francisco. I left so that my children could go to school. Isn't that amazing to say? in the 2020s in the United States of America? It's, it's madness. It's 
madness. And the thing that is crazy to me now, at what are we, four years out, and it does seem that the consensus at this point is the school closures were both ineffective and harmful, but there is no, it's sort of like, oops, this happened because of COVID. There's no, no people did this. These were decisions. They were poor decisions by public health bureaucrats and governors, like my governor at the time, Gavin Newsom, who was sending his own kids to private school the whole time. Um, these were decisions and these people should not be in power anymore. And I will not stop talking about it. Well, keep, keep going. I, I remember when uh, you, you, for us uh, as, as a family kind of burst onto the scene because of the, the COVID nonsense. And, and my wife said, that is one brave lady because we just assumed that you're an executive at Levi's. Levi's is a certain corporate culture that for those of us as conservatives, I mean, this is a friend, you know, yeah. but people, audi by the way, the audience of the show knows we have anybody on the show, so we, we can talk about whatever, um, th that, you know, we probably have a, at least a little, slightly different political worldview. And yet the thing that I kept saying in Austin, Texas, where we were living to the officials there, who of course had different politics than Kevin Roberts. Yeah, was, I mean, Austin guys, this should just should transcend liberal and conservative. This is about kids going to school. It's about keeping businesses open, trusting Americans who are generally virtuous people to make the decisions for their own lives and their well-being. But our powers that be from the public health bureaucrats in D.C. to your goofy former governor to the goofy mayor of Austin. Then, He's still got the it governor. He's just not my guy. That's right. <laughs> that is correct. Unfortunately. Yeah. I hope his star is falling, but I'm not so sure. We need some more people to wake up about that. But I, I don't want to derail you from your story because I was going to ask you to walk us through that where you you realize, and, and by the way, any of us on the right can do this too. We can you know, reassess our prior convictions and so on. So I'm not trying to single you out there, but I think it's instructive for us at this critical point in the United States to have the humility yeah. and the maturity to say, man, what I thought I knew about people I trusted, people in power has just been wrong. Yeah. And I think, you know, most of the people I know now who are my friends on the right and I lost, I mean, I lost my entire friend group. I bet you did. I've got about one friend left from, you know, back in the day from when I went to Stanford that still speaks to me and he's amazing and he's probably my best friend. But um, yeah, my entire sort of female friend group cohort crickets. It's amazing. Um, yeah, because this was considered, I mean, the world went mad. The world went completely insane. And if you dared ask a question, and I was very diplomatic the whole time. It's just my way. You sort of learn that as a woman in corporate America. You have this very, I have this well-trained diplomatic voice. Um, so I just, you know, I got the, the the onslaught and the dragging I got was from my sort of outspokenness on social media. Um, but I was always very measured and, you know, cited facts and just asked questions. Sometimes I don't like that position. I'm just asking questions and it can be disingenuous, but I was like, are we sure this is the best thing to do for our children? We knew very early on that children were at little to no risk and much less likely to, to spread COVID. But the entire world went mad in the beginning. I mean, the right and the left, no one. It was very lonely. But I think, you know, to, to your point about your wife's comment, I, I start these things. It was the same when I wrote my book about abuse and gymnastics, sort of naively. I think it's my naivete that gets me in trouble. Like, I, I'm like, who's going to mind if I ask questions? Like, surely everybody's going to see at some point that this is bad for children. And at least and, be willing to have a conversation about it, right? And then I get down the path and I realize that the blowback is intense. And then I get mad and I'm like, you can't tell me what to say. People have asked me, over the years, you know, why is this the hill you were willing to die on? Um, and my answer every time is I don't really understand why you weren't. If you're not willing to stand up for children and free speech, which is at the end of the day what I was standing up for, then I don't really think you have any principles. It's that, it's that simple. So you leave San Francisco. Levi's is, is now in the rearview mirror. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you, you start this new athletic line, in which we will talk about. But you, in addition to these other things we've covered, you've also leaned into another 
really important arena and that's saving women's sports. Yeah. Yeah. I, it took me a couple of years to start the business from when I left Levi's. I, um, worked on a film for a bit and we can talk about that. It's not done yet, but almost it's called generation COVID. Um, and I was consulting. I sort of took a little break to get my, you know, my bearings. And I just realized my firm belief is that we all have to contribute to, the cultural conversation, the bringing together of people in our own way with our un own unique skills. I was asked actually many times if I would run for office in Colorado, and I literally can't think of anything that sounds worse than, than that. So I just started to think I had this unique opportunity as a former elite athlete, a business executive that led one of the most beloved brands in the world to start something that is positive and that is beautiful, elevated product, not a gimmick that could change hearts and minds. Because, you know, one area that people do come together on is this idea of protecting women's sports and keeping women's sports and spaces female. Seventy percent of Americans agree. That's a lot of Democrats. I've been on this um, bus tour. Bus tour. <laughs> I've done a few of the stops. There's one um, tonight here in D.C. It is the most politically diverse group of women that you can imagine. There are self-avowed lefties, there's independents like me who don't know where they fit, there's center-right, there's religious, there's non-religious, there's everybody. Young, still competitive athletes, old athletes, Martina Navratilova, who's the one of the winningest tennis players in the world, lefty, super outspoken on this topic. I'm very excited to meet her. It, I it, it's her so yet. important. It, it, you talk about another brave person. She's been amazing. And the fact is, is this should not be controversial. Everybody understood until about five minutes ago that male and female bodies were different. Now, suddenly it's offensive to say that. Now, suddenly we're expected to carry this lie forward, which is there's no difference between male and female bodies and that sex is not binary. It's so stupid. I can't even believe this is the world we it, live in. It's ridiculous. We're even having the conversation as a country. Yeah, I was going to use a word I'm not going to use. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and I, it's just sort of evidence of how ideology can really brainwash people into saying things that they know are not true. And I feel like COVID was that too. That was ideological as well. Well, there, there are real parallels there. Because yeah. Because the, the behavior is the same. Um, you, you have the same people who would describe ourselves as, you know, just put kind of political behavior off to the side, just common sense people, which is a vast, vast, vast majority of human beings on this planet and especially Americans, because what is been consistent about Americans through our whole history is our pragmatism. That we're, we're very practical people. And so we, up until this point on these issues, we haven't had time for this kind of nonsense. And that's also troubling, but all of that to say, we got to figure out how to turn the corner, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we all agreed and we're guided by the you know, principles of, in, of the Enlightenment. And we all agreed that we, um, in open debate and dissent, in the search for truth. Now, truth is apparently subjective. You know, this is one of the things that actually I started questioning on the left. The phrase, my truth, really bothered me from the time I saw it and heard it start to appear, which for me was kind of in the midst of the beginning of the Me Too movement. People, this is my truth. And I would tell people, don't don't say that. You know, some of the victims of Larry Nasser would speak about my truth. And I would say, it's the truth that he assaulted you. Don't call it my truth. And don't denigrate it by calling it anything no. other than the truth. It lends, it credes to this idea that truth is subjective. Now, we all have different experiences. But the phrase, my truth, <clears throat> for a male to say about, be, you know, to declare his femaleness therefore be able to enter a locker room at the University of Pennsylvania or enter the NCAA finals <laughs> against women. I don't care what your truth is. The truth is you are male. Compete in a category that aligns with your sex. That's the truth. But the, the subjectivity of truth is I feel like where we've gone wrong and abandoned those principles that we all had agreed upon before. <laughs> On, on that point, uh, in particular, the point of, of men in women's sports, as you do this bus tour, as you, uh, I was going to say, as you talk to your, your liberal friends, but it sounds like maybe it's a diminishing any. number. <laughs> do you get the sense that as a country, because it is such an overwhelming majority of Americans who think this is a ridiculous thing, that 
men or in women's sports that we're on the cusp of turning the corner? I believe we will win because it is true. And I believe truth outs in the end. I do not think we're on the cusp. I think we're, so we've this, got some work to do. I think we have a lot of work to do. I think we're far because we are so polarized at this point. And um, we've had some wins, um, you know, this summer at the Olympics. It has been, you know, re redeclared that males cannot compete in swimming and they cannot compete in um, track and field. And I believe a couple of other a couple of other sports, um, the rugby association governing body has said no biological males in women's rugby is just too dangerous, which I completely agree with. So there are these like hints at sanity. But, you know, let me tell you, a week ago, my brand XXXY Athletics uh, ran an ad, which I think is incredibly inspiring and uplifting on TikTok. And we were banned less than a week later. They did not tell us what ad policy we violated. They said we were banned for offensive content. So apparently standing up for women and girls is offensive. To me, that is a reminder of the hill we have to climb. I think the deck is stacked against us. Corporate America, big tech, they're all, you know, coming at us. And that was one of the reasons I felt like I could start a brand that makes a difference. Why is corporate America so ideologically conformist at this point? I mean, it's been taken over by far left activists. Now, I don't think the CEOs of these companies believe any of this garbage. They see it as a money-making strategy. And to me, that's just gross. It's even they, worse. Yeah, they're like wrapping themselves in false virtue because they want people to like them while they kind of keep all the money for themselves. <laughs> um, but I just felt like there was an opportunity for me to – none of these athletic brands, they all pretend to stand up for women and none of them actually do it. Nike is notorious for treating women with astonishing disregard. And so it just felt like that was an opportunity for me. And, you know, the parallel economy is something that's burgeoning and we see – but I don't want to be in the parallel economy. You'll be in the economy. I don't think those of us who are said to participate, I don't think we should accept that. I don't want, nobody puts baby in a corner, <laughs> as they say. I want to be the regular economy. 70% of Americans agree with me and with my team. So why shouldn't, why should we be relegated to a corner? It's well said. I can see the fire of the athletes come out. <laughs> this is good. I, I will tell you, this is why the ideologues are going to lose this because female athletes are nothing if not disciplined and resilient. And we fall down and we get back up and we keep fighting. And so, um, you know, I broke my femur and won USA's nine months later. We're not giving up. The women on this tour are fighters. You have Nancy Hogshead McCarr, 84 uh, swimmer and 80, 1984 and, and many time gold medalist. You've got Martina, one of the winningest female tennis players of all time. You've got Riley Gaines. So many tough, strong, inspiring women. So we won't lose just for that reason alone is we don't give up. And the truth is on our side. So I agree with all of that. And and this follow-up question is not partisan at all. We actually don't do partisan stuff here. We're, you know, philosophical. Um, but do you see politics writ large, like the whole arena of politics from left yeah. to right, as standing in the way of making progress on this issue of saving women's sports? Or it just hasn't been tapped into? By that, what I'm getting at is, is it is it getting in the way of Americans just kind of thinking for themselves about the common sense nature of this. Yeah. That was my fear. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I have, there are people in politics, you know, whether they're elected officials or people adjacent to it, I think are doing good work. I of course work with some of them. Yeah. So I'm not, I mean, I'm celebrating what they do, but I think the larger political conversation, because we politicize everything in this country, yeah. is standing in the way of progress on this. I think that's right. I mean, politics is a team sport, right? Right, And you root for your team. That's right. Even if you um, maybe think they're not doing the right thing. And that's what happened during COVID. And if you were an anti-lockdowner or, you know, if you got billed as an anti-masker or an open schools mom, that's what, you know, I was uh, deemed. That was coded as right. You were coded as a Trumper. I was told I was QAnon. I had to look that up. I didn't even know what it was. I don't think they exist anymore. That's I don't a hell know. Of a thing to say, <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh gosh. Um, but, you know, being called those things publicly when you live 
in San Francisco, where I think 96 percent of the population is Democrat and voted for Biden in the last election. That's a disincentive for anybody else to stand up and say anything. There's nothing worse. It's worse than being called a racist, although I was called that, too. <laughs> you know, that being called right wing, alt right, Koch brothers funded, like all those things, um, it's a it's. It really discourages others from from speaking up because you don't want to be seen on that other team. That other team is evil. I just stopped caring because it was so dumb that you have to just dismiss it. That's the right response. It took me a while, though. Well, sure. Yeah, it took me a while. It's not fun to be called a, you know, a racist or, you know, now called homophobe and uh, transphobe and anti-LGBTQ, but it's just so dumb. I mean, I lived in San Francisco for 35 years. I've been to more pride parades and marches than you can fathom. I worked in the fashion industry in San Francisco. I would venture to guess that 30% of my team was gay. They were just the L or the G. There weren't all the other yeah. things. Although I did have a couple of um, of trans people on my team. Everybody was treated with dignity and respect. You had to do the job. It was a merit-based organization. Um, I've probably been to more gay weddings than straight weddings. So it's nonsense. It's nonsense. So tell us about XXXY Athletics. How's it going? What's what, what, what are the big plans coming up? How can people... Learn more. Yeah. We're baby brand, three months old. Really, really. You're in the, at the beginning. Yeah. Someone told me in the early days it, before we launched that uh, when you do a startup, which is not something I ever want to do, the highest, high, the days are going to be, you know, your best day is going to be so much better than your best day in an existing structure. And the worst is going to be so much worse. That is 100 percent true because I feel really responsible. I feel responsible for the people have come, who have chosen to kind of hitch their cart to my horse. Um, I'm like, I'm toxic. You'll never get another job again if this doesn't work. So, but it's going really well. I mean, I think people, the support has been amazing. The business has been like this. Um, I think people are grateful to have an option that aligns with their values and just says really obvious, true things. We're the only brand that knows what a woman is. I mean, I say that in jest, but not really. Unfortunately, that's true. Yeah. This should not be just like COVID. This should not be political. Men and women are different. Women's sports were created for a reason. Women are amazing, but they are don't have the same physical abilities that men do. Males are faster and stronger. That's it. And we can celebrate all of these things. I love watching women's sports. We do too. I mean, women's gymnastics is the most watched sport in the Summer Olympics. And I guarantee you it will be this summer because Simone Biles is going to kill it. It's an amazing sport to watch. Everybody loves watching women's basketball right now, right? And I was just about to say, I mean, uh, we're, for the first time, WNBA fans. So the more mm. people try to cancel Caitlin Clark, the more. the more Americans are kind of to the point of this conversation rallying, not just around her, yeah. but about something broader, which she's so elegantly she and is. quietly represents, which is just a return to normal. That's all American. She's just, for. yeah, she's amazing. She's fun to watch. It's sort of like watching Steph Curry with the three pointer. I mean, she has a fun game to watch, but I would even argue, you know, to some extent the, the, the rivalry is a little ginned up by the media between Angel and Caitlin, but a great rivalry is also what makes people want to watch. Always, regardless of the sport. I mean, have at it girls. Like that's amazing. It's, it's a lot of fun. Tell us about the film that you're working okay. on. Um, it's not out yet. It is not out yet. Um, it is called Generation COVID. For about two years, we followed kids and families across the country uh, to understand the fallout and the aftermath. We cover all the issues from learning loss to dropping out and absenteeism, mental health impact, um, suicide, unfortunately. Um, and I will tell you, the kids are they're not all right. It's really sad and we're not doing what we need to do to help them. And we have not collectively declared that this can never happen again. And so I get, you know, everybody's over COVID. Why are you still talking about it? I get that all the time because it could happen again. And our kids aren't over COVID in the sense no. of the, the effect of the lockdowns of their schools, right? It's going to take 
as I say, 10 years, but it's really going to take a generation to work through that. I do. I do think so. I mean, when you think about the fact that chronic absenteeism is twice what it was before COVID, that means in some schools and districts, it's 30 to 50 percent of the students are chronically absent. Those kids aren't learning the basic skills. They'll graduate because they'll just get passed, but they won't have the basic skills to hold jobs. This imp impacts us all. And I get so mad at people who say, well, my kid was fine. My kid loved it. I don't care. Fine. <laughs> too many kids were not fine. And too many kids, it takes not that much empathy to understand that for a kid who has, you know, a single mom who worked an hourly wage job who could not be home with that child, a young child, that that kid was not safe and not learning. I, I don't understand why people couldn't put themselves in the shoes of a family that was different than theirs. But I would say to you from having made this film, even the kids that had more means could not overcome the isolation. You know, a teenager, that's when you're supposed to be out in the world individuating from your parents and they were locked at home with their parents in some instances for a year and a half, not good. That's, it's terrible. We hope to have you back many times over Thanks. the years about upcoming projects. But for now, I'm gonna ask you one final question. Okay. And it, it's, it's a question that I ask almost every guest. Okay. In spite of all of the reasons that Americans have to be pessimistic about the future. Yeah. Why did you, and I presume that you did, why did you wake up this morning optimistic about the American future? Well, I think I'm an optimist by nature. I can tell sitting with you. Um, not that I don't get down, but I'm an optimist by nature. You don't try to do really hard things if you don't believe you can actually succeed. I don't believe my success is guaranteed, but I believe if I work really hard and make good decisions and take advantage of the opportunities presented to me, that I can succeed. And so I'm encouraged because despite the fact that I've lost many friends, I found a lot of new ones, a lot of really talented people, um, a, a group of people that is not conformist. We all think very differently, the people that are working for me. The promise we made to each other is we will never get offended. Oh, what a great promise. The goal is that people speak openly at work because we can't be creative and do big things if we aren't able to speak freely. So that's why I feel optimistic because I've come together with this ragtag group of semi-canceled people to try to do a really hard thing. And I think we're going to succeed. Thank you for that answer. And it, 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 your answer reminds me, by the way, of a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Rex, who, who abandoned the West Coast as well and went to Texas. And his, his politics or sort of origin politics are from the opposite side of the spectrum from yours, but he's landed in the same spot with his business. He's a real estate guy, great fellow, just like you're a great lady. And he hires, he was asked, um, I saw this last week, he was asked by some reporter, you know, who had it out for him, well, I guess you don't hire any liberals because you're this conservative, very serious Roman Catholic guy. He said, no, I, I relish hiring liberals because that's where we're going to be better as a company. And hopefully we will witness this civil discourse among yes. our differences, yes. not just to the people who work with us, but the people around us, our clients. I just thought his response and your response were really telling about where American business can go. Yeah, I feel, I mean, I've written about this fairly extensively, the sort of culture of censorship that we find, you know, I'm not talking about the First Amendment, I'm talking about this culture where we self-censor for fear of being canceled and where you feel a lot of pressure to censor yourself within the corporate environment. That is really bad for American innovation. It's terrible. It's Imagine if you're so scared to utter any, like you can't, you can't have a brainstorming session where you actually come up with any ideas. And so I, we have to move past it. And that was our promise to each other. We're just six people right now. Um, but that I will retain that as a mantra. The other promise I've made to myself is that I will avoid having an HR department as long as is humanly possible. That is so <laughs> smart. It is so smart. <laughs> so tell us where to find XXXY Athletics. Go to xx-xyathletics.com or we have a fun vanity URL, which is thetruthfits.com. That's awesome. And you have a special offer for Heritage Friends? We do. 15% off for uh, Heritage Friends and Family. So Heritage15 is the code. Put that promo code in when you check out and you get 15% off. 
Jennifer Say, thanks for being a great American. Thanks for taking the time to visit with us. And we wish you the greatest success in the coming years. Thank you. I so appreciate it. I'd love to come back when the film is distributed. We'll, we'll make a point of it. That'd be Thank amazing. You. Thank you. I told you you'd have fun with this conversation. Hopefully you track down Jennifer and her colleagues and also other American businesses. We hope a growing number who are just saying, put politics off to the side. We just want to do business and we just want to return to normal in this otherwise great country. Thanks for making the show possible. Thanks for tuning in and keep your chin up. We are going to take back this country. Take care. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. The executive producer is Crystal Kate Bonham. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and Tim Kennedy. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.